Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our new class in the new year. Uh, this is the Shaping of Middle Earth class as we kick off the 2016, well, Happy New Year, everybody, by the way, the 2016 Mythgard Academy seminars. I am really excited as we move forward uh, at the ex at the insistence of our electorate as we charge forward with the uh, our uh, study of the History of Middle Earth series, now doing moving along to Volume 4. Uh, so, uh, so welcome, Yana. Good to see you back. Happy New Year to you. Um, okay, so, uh, so welcome. First, uh, let me just remind you for those of you who are uh, who are new or who have forgotten about it. Um, if you go to the web page for the Shaping of Middle Earth class, you will see the link to the chat room in the bottom right hand corner. If you would like to chat with your fellow. Uh, attendees during the session, uh, you are welcome to do that there. Um, uh, I won't see the things that you type there, so if you want to talk about me behind your back and place bets on how many, uh, place uncharitable bets upon how many how many passages I'm going to get through tonight, you go there. Uh, if you have comments that you want me to see, you type them in here on your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, and I will see those. So, okay, just a little procedural reminder there. Um, uh, announcements before we begin. Of course, the main announcement next week begins our spring 2016 semester, and we have a lot of uh, really fun uh, classes uh, this coming term, uh, which I am really excited about. One of the ones that I'm really looking forward to most um, is one which actually kind of uh, we, we sort of came across rather late uh, in our planning. It's been sort of a surprise and a delightful surprise for me, and that is... Um, uh, uh, Doug Anderson's uh, The Inklings in Science Fiction class. Um, so he's going to be looking at science fiction in the middle of the 20th century through the window of the Inklings, looking at their own interest in science fiction, their own, you know, especially Lewis and Tolkien, their own, their own endeavors in science fiction, uh, and then the science fiction that they continued to read and discuss and, uh, and learn from after that. Um, it's, I, I think, should be a really, really great way. It, it will be a way to look at Lewis and Tolkien in ways that you really Really haven't uh, be before. I feel fairly confident uh, that that you know almost nobody really thinks about them in conjunction with science fiction and the development of science fiction in the 20th century. Um, but they were right in the middle of that and thought a great deal about it uh, and were very interested in it. So that's going to be. And Doug Anderson is just such a such a wonderful experience um, to uh, to learn with Doug, who just knows more about f fantasy and science fiction in the 20th century than anybody that I know. It's uh, it's it's going to be absolutely fantastic. So a wonderful opportunity there. I'm going to be doing my modern fantasy class, a selection of, uh, of books, mostly from uh, uh, the, the, the 80s and the last decade. Um, looking at, you know, another uh, sort of instance of my sort of sampling of post-Tolkien fantasy, looking at fantasy of the last 30 years and uh, some sort of trends and ideas that we can see going on through there. should be a lot of fun. And our third literature class for this semester is... What is it? I'm blanking on it. Oh yes, of course, the invented languages class, um, where uh, we're gonna, where, where you're not only gonna be able uh, to have the opportunity to learn uh, Tolkien's Elvish languages, um, but also be looking at the development of his uh, Elvish languages, and you will learn more in this class about uh, what it really means to Tolkien to say, you know, when he says that uh, the development of his languages and the invention, you know, the, the sort of the, the development of his invented languages over time and the relationship between that and his stories uh, and his sort of whole imaginative world. Um, this is going to be a wonderful way of looking at that um, and a phenomenal opportunity uh, with Dr. Andrew Higgins, who's going to be leading that class along with with uh, Dimitri Femi and Carl Hostetter, uh, two of the great world experts on the subject. So um, anyway, that's uh, uh, those are. And then we're also uh, offering our introductory Latin class at this coming semester too, our uh, in our uh, language program. So um Really fun class. Want to make sure that you have the opportunity. We have the rest of this week to enroll. Well, we enrollment is open for the next three weeks, but the classes start next week. Uh, so if you don't want to be behind, this week would be the one to do it. So I want to make sure to remind you to go there. Go to MythGuard.org or SignumUniversity.org and click on Current Classes, and you will see the links for this semester's classes. So don't forget to check that out. All right. Let's talk about the shaping of Middle-Earth. 
Um, and before we start, and I can already hear the people who were betting the under in the chat room uh, rubbing their hands in glee, um, let's do a little bit of recap. Because, of course, this is Volume 4 of the History of Middle-Earth, and I know that many of you, from scanning the attendee list, uh, many of you I know have been regulars and have been uh, doing the History of Middle-Earth series uh, with me all along over the last, goodness, year now? I mean, because we did other books in between, um, including Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which I did for like three and a half months. Um, but anyway, like a year and a half, maybe. Anyway, it's been a while since we started Book of Lost Tales, Volume 1. Um, so let me, let me do a, a, a brief, I'm hoping brief, uh, recap of this early part of Tolkien's career and where we are here at the beginning of Volume 4 in the, the material that we read for tonight, Chapters 1 and 2, um, if you're doing your homework and following along with our schedule. Um, so, in the beginning, the, Tolkien's imaginative world, Tolkien's mythology, really begins with some of his early poems. Of course, uh, you have probably heard the story of uh, you know, him coming across the name Eärendil in, Anglo- in an Anglo-Saxon poem in, 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 uh, in, in the Christ, and, uh, and how that name just kind of you know, evoked these ideas. And, and he wrote a poem about that, the, uh, uh, the, the, his Eärendil poem about Eärendil, the Wandering Star. Um, these were sort of mythic ideas, ideas that really grasped his imagination. There wasn't much in the way of stories. The early Eärendil poems contain sort of mythic elements. There's, um, I don't know, to some extent, if you read them on their own, not thinking about them th- sort of through the lens of his later mythological writings, that is, if you forget about Eärendil the Mariner, father of Elrond, right, and and just read those poems kind of on their own, um, to some extent they sort of they make me think of... Uh, of Alice in Through the Looking Glass when uh, she says, after she reads the poem Jabberwocky, uh, and says, it seems if, it seems to fill my head with ideas, but I'm not quite sure what they are. Um, that's always, anyway, my experience of reading some of those early poems by Tolkien. That is the, there's something there, there's something behind it, but it's not exactly a story, or at least it's hard to see what the story is. Um, and sometimes, as I said, I think it's a little bit deceptive. We think we can see a story, but that's because we're projecting backward the story that's eventually going to develop about Eärendil, if we really come at it knowing nothing or, or, or really trying to clear our minds of what it will develop into, I think it's not really at all very clear. But anyway, again, it's, it's, it's very evocative. He had these, these concepts. Um, Eärendil, the star, and the, the Eärendil, the wandering star, is how I would characterize the idea of that poem. Those elements, his connection with, with the star... Um, the idea that he is wandering, indeed, uh, uh, an adventurous wanderer uh, in that poem. So you had some of these these uh, sort of tastes of, of, of mythic concepts that were floating around in his poems. And then we also have him beginning to develop mythic stories. Um, so here I'm thinking, of course, especially, and this, of course, being a timely one with the recent release of Rowan Flieger's edition of the, uh, the, the, the early Turin story, the early uh, uh, Kulervo, um, his, his treatment of Kulervo, uh, the story from the Kalevala, upon which... Uh, well, I was about to say upon which the Turin Turinbar story is based, perhaps safer to say, um, by which the Turin Turinbar story was uh, uh, was inspired. He was deeply moved by the Kalevala, uh, and uh, w- th- was particularly struck by that per- that particular story of Kulervo, uh, and uh, you know began to formulate his own stories. You know, sort of following that as a model, and and sort of thinking through those kind of wanting to do sort of something like that. We can see also in other early stories, such as the Fall of Gondolin. We talked at the time when we did the Book of Lost Tales, Volume Two, uh, which contains the story of the Fall of Gondolin. That in the Fall of Gondolin, we were reading a story which seemed to be not quite fully freestanding, um, but which did seem to predate even the other Lost Tales story. We could see sort of his concepts in an er- in an earlier and Something closer to a kind of a standalone story uh, there, I think, in, uh, in, in the Fall of Gondolin, which he's working in the Book of Lost Tales to integrate, um, but it isn't really fully integrated yet. So we get these, his sort of, um, 
experimentation with these mythic concepts in some of his early poetry, his then beginning to sort of form his own narratives and, and, and sort of turn his hand in his early years there at telling some of these stories on his own. Then, of course, the next and the, the, the first really big step was bringing them together into the Book of Lost Tales. And this is the first time we really get uh, the beginning of him really building his mythology and bringing all these stories together. Um, I would emphasize, of course, the frame narrative that he puts them in. So we have this, you know, the stories, what we will later call the stories from the first age or the Silmarillion stories. Um, but of course, he puts them in the frame narrative of the human mariner, Ariel, who ends up in Tol Erisea and hears these stories. That is the, the, the core of the frame story. The thread which ties all of those stories together is the story about how these authentic stories of the histories of the elves, of the true history of the elves, how they came among men. How is it that we have them? Why do we still have these garbled stories about elves and magic and this ancient time in which uh, wonders were still happening in the world. We have all these, all these echoes and memories of those things in our own stories and our own folklore. Where do we get them, and where do they come from? And and answering that question is kind of what the frame of uh, of the Book of Lost Tales is designed to do. And of course, this is part of the project, as we talked about at the time. Um, what he has famously called his, you know, his his desire to uh, to write a mythology for England, a native mythology uh, for England. Um, but again, that frame is really all about showing how we uh, um, we got to our current situation. And of course, current, by current situation, I mean current situation at the end of the 19th century, not just in modern times, but with the traditions of little diminutive fairies and things, right? Um, as we talked about at the time, originally he did not just, he did not reject diminutive fairies. Instead, what he was initially setting out to do is explain how fairies came to be diminutive. They weren't always like that, right? That's not the whole story. Um, they used to be... So later on in his career, he'll just simply reject the whole diminutive thing. But at first, he wasn't rejecting it. He was explaining it, right? Um, okay, and then, of course, as you'll remember, if you did the Book of Lost Tales Part 2 class with me, um, you will remember how at the end we get this shift, the shift in the frame story, the shift uh, which is mostly marked by the, the name of the main character, right? It changes from Ariel uh, to Alfwina, the uh, Anglo-Saxon name. But, of course, it's not... There's much more to it than just the change of the name. It's really a change in the entire concept of the of the frame, um, the how it's set in English history connected to the Anglo-Saxon period, and the entire way in which the Alfwina story works in the way that it interacts with the Elvish stories um, leads him to you know the, these new ideas that he has about it sort of necessitates, especially in the sort of Tolkien perfectionistic writing world, um, a, a, you know, a really pretty large rethink and reworking of the whole, uh, of the whole Lost Tales project. And this, as we, as we suggested, or as I suggested, um, in, uh, when we were talking about the Book of Lost Tales, Volume 2, this seems to be, um, likely what led him to abandon the Book of Lost Tales, because he, he was at a point where his ideas had changed, and if he was going to do it, he had to totally redo it. He'd go back and rewrite everything. But that's not what he wanted to do anymore. He didn't want to go back and rewrite the entire Book of Lost Tales, so he just kind of dropped it. And what did he do? After the Book of Lost Tales was derailed, you know, it seemed to be what, something like 75% finished? You may remember the references to the fact that there were going to be like seven chapters of, of uh, Arendelle stories, so maybe it wasn't 75%, but, um, but in any case, it, was, it, was, it would seem to be pretty close to done, um, but then, uh, then went off in a different direction. Here's now where it starts to get a little bit complicated, to some extent, at least as it connects with the, uh, the early part of, of our, well, the reading that we did for today in The Shaping of Middle-Earth. Um, so you'll remember, once he 
needs to go back and redo the Book of Lost Tales, but decides he doesn't want to go back and completely redo the Book of Lost Tales, he just, he turns back to some of those original big stories, right? He wants to, uh, and so he does this combo thing, right? You know, I was talking about how these, you know, the stories of his mythology grew out of some of the early poems that he wrote combined with his early uh, uh, attempt to write some of these epic stories on his own, right? Um, well, he goes back and says, I'm going to do both, right? I'm going to tell epic tales in verse. Uh, and we get, of course, the alliterative lay of the children of Hurin, which we got in the first half of the Lays of Beleriand, which was the last of the books that we did before, the, the last of the uh, Tolkien books that we did before this. And you can kind of see how this emerges. There's, there is a sense in which, conceptually, the lay of the children of Hurin makes perfect sense as the thing that he would do next. Um, that is, remember, one of the things we were getting before in the shift to Elflina from Ariel is like we're taking these elf stories and we're combining them with this Anglo-Saxon context, right? And that's what we're getting in the alliterative lay of the children of Hurin, right? We're gonna where he's going back and he's redoing um, one of the you know the, the 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 greatest and most fully thought through of his stories, and he's going to tell it in essentially Anglo-Saxon meter, right? Modern English words, language, but uh, still the uh, the poetic form of the Anglo-Saxon meter. Um, so we can see him, I mean, elf stories plus Anglo-Saxon context, yeah, that's what he's doing there in that in that poem, right? So it's it's this, it's, it's a similar impulse to the elf a revision, um, just on a different thing, right? Um, but at the same time, I don't want to separate those two things. I mean, that is to say, another way of looking at this is that this is also his continuing development and refinement of his mythology and telling these stories. But it's also his scholarly interest as well, right? In Anglo-Saxon uh, poetry and poetics, this is what he did. Um, you know, his study of Anglo-Saxon language and poetry um, was his was his professional life. But. You know, those two impulses, I think, are really almost exactly the same. I mean, I, I and then something, something that I get more in, I have impressed upon me, I feel anyway, more and more firmly, the more time I spend studying um, uh, Tolkien's works, especially, you know, these sort of um, around the edges works, not just The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, but, uh, uh, but all these other things that he was doing kind of in the background, a lot of the stuff that didn't get published. And um, you can just see how this is how he thought. This is how he, pro- you know, this wasn't this wasn't him um, taking a break from his scholarship to do something for fun instead, right? This is this, you know, the same impulse that led him to write his, uh, you know, his essays like the Monsters and the Critics. Um, is is exactly the same thing that leads him to uh to write the fall of arthur or uh or the lay of the alliterative lay of the children of Hurin, um or the legend of sigurd and gudrun or any of those things um this is just how he um this is just how he 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 processed stuff um that 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 same kind of creative impulse i was just uh, uh recently I've been uh, I've been rereading the Humphrey Carpenter biography uh, of Tolkien, and I, I was just uh, the other day reading about the um, sort of the the moments of embarrassment that Tolkien had after the Lord of the Rings came out, and many of his colleagues in Oxford were kind of giving him a hard time about it, you know, and we're all you know because they'd been wondering for many years like why hasn't Tolkien produced you know, but they they've been expecting more great works of scholarship from him because they they had great respect for him as a scholar, and yet his scholarly output in terms of actual scholarly publications was pretty small, actually. And um, I, I, I mean, I don't think in an American university he probably would have gotten tenure, though. I don't know. I mean, he didn't publish fast enough. I don't think to get tenure in an American university, and even if he got it, I don't think he'd have been promoted. Um, but anyway, so again, his scholarly epi- So then the Lord of the Rings comes out, right? And his colleagues are all like, oh, okay, right. Now we see what you've been doing with your time instead of doing, instead of pursuing serious scholarship. I think that's unfair. I mean, you know, I understand why they would say it. But again, I don't think it's a question. In Tolkien's in mind, in, sort of in the world of Tolkien's mind, I don't think this really was a question of him doing something else instead of his scholarship. It's all really wrapped up together. Anyway, okay. Um, so... 1918-ish, you know, he's, he's, well, 
Book of Lost Tales or as finished as they're going to get. He sets them aside, and instead um, he goes back and he um, uh, he writes the alliterative lay of the children of Hurin. Um, well, starts writing it. Doesn't get all the way through, as you'll remember. Um, but uh, but gets a good bit of, uh, of of the way into it. You'll remember when we did the Lays of Balerion, Volume 3 of the History of Middle-earth series, it's that, that book is primarily divided into two, right? We get the, the, the Lay of the Children of Hurin, and then the Lay of Lathian, of course, the, uh, the rhyming couplet um, epic poem version of, uh, of the story of Baron and Luthien. This is where it gets a little bit confusing. Um, because it's important for us to remember. Um, since we're coming at this, you know, sort of marching through books at a time, and now we're starting book four, we know the history of Middle-earth series is kind of chronological, so um, we kind of have the Children of Hurin, the Way of the Children of Hurin, and uh, the Lay of Lathian in our heads uh, as we're coming to book four here, as we start today's reading. Um, but we have to... It's important for us to remember that the material we're doing tonight actually predates the Lay of Lathian. The Lay of Lathian was later on. This was like 1926 was when he wrote the sketch of the mythology, which is what we're going to be spending most of our time talking about tonight. Um, it was like 1928 that he wrote most of the Lay of Lathian. Like 28, 29, 30, up, up in there. Um, so, chronologically speaking, it doesn't come after what was in all of what was in the previous volume. It comes after the alliterative lay of the children of Hurin, but it comes before the lay of Lathian. And we need to remember that, especially when we're talking about the Baron and Luthian stuff. Um, we need to remember that we can't sort of presume upon what we know from the lay of Lathian and think that this is the next stage that comes forward. It's the stage beforehand. Um, so we have to just remember to keep that straight. Um, because where does this get, you know, why does this happen this way? Why do we get this? Remember, this sketch, what's called the sketch, what he calls the sketch of the mythology, what later on he wrote on the envelope and called this the earliest Silmarillion, um, this is basically a supporting document to the children of Hurin. He was sending the children of Hurin out to an outside reader, and he wanted to provide that reader with some context. So he wrote this summary, right? Um, he wrote this summary of um, of his mythology to provide context for the alliterative children of Hurin. Um, that's why there's uh, the story of Turin uh, and the story of Hurin and all that gets a lot of uh, time in the sketch because, of course, it's designed to uh, to explain all this stuff. Um, but isn't that kind of fascinating to think about? Like, let's pause for a second and think about what that means, right? This text, the sketch of the mythology, which he wrote in 1926, the sketch of the mythology um, is the birth of the Silmarillion. It is, it is, as Christopher Tolkien points out, and this is, this is, this is a, you know, a very clear point, the published Silmarillion, you can say that the Book of Lost Tales is the first version of, of it, and it's certainly, it's the first full treatment of those stories, the stories that are going to be refined and revised, and, 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 and the history. But the Book of Lost Tales is a fundamentally different kind of thing from the published Silmarillion. And I don't mean the stories have evolved and changed so that they're unrecognizable. I mean, as a species of narrative, it's a completely different thing. Um, the tone is different. The whole approach to storytelling is different. Um, we just... It's different. We don't get it. Um, this is the origin. And the origin not only of the... of this, You can say it's not the origin of the stories, right? It's an intermediary step in the stories. But it is the origin of the kind of book that we get uh, in the published Silmarillion that will remain... Uh, sort of the model of the Silmarillion pretty much from now on. That is that what uh, what Christopher Tolkien calls an epitomized narrative, right? A narrative which is not, um, you know, he's going to do some annals. We'll look at annals later on in this book. That is, you know, sort of year-by-year -year chronology of events. The published Silmarillion is not a set of annals, right? That's not how those proceed. Instead, we get this kind of overview um you know, we talked about this a lot way back when, when I was doing the Summerlian seminar, how 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 so much of the narrative 
framework of the published Silmarillion is, you know, from a thousand feet up, right? And we're looking at the whole landscape and, and dictate, you know, not dictating, but uh, narrating, um, you just sort of huge segments of time and sort of summarizing what goes on rather than actually sort of coming down sort of to ground level and telling those stories. Think about the difference between the version of the Turin Turambar story that we get in the published Silmarillion and compare that to the to the Children of Hurin, the, no, the novel version that was published, the version which is drawn primarily uh, from the version of that story that's published in Unfinished Tales previously. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's different not only in the fact, it's, it's not just that it contains some more stuff. We have a different kind of relationship with Turin and you know with the characters and with the narrative um, in many at many points in that narrative than we get in the published Silmarillion. There are times when it comes in more closely and we get dialogue and we get uh, you know we get a, a much more um, sort of up close narrative description of the of the things that um, uh, that that happen. But it's not the default mode of the Silmarillion. The default mode of the Silmarillion is essentially summary and this and it's fascinating to think that when you trace back the Silmarillion in this format that it's in the root of it its origin the origin of the modern form of the Silmarillion is literally in a plot summary a plot summary that he wrote for an outside reader right just to give them a, a, a brief background right um, in other words this piece the sketch of the mythology that we're talking about tonight, it's not a literary piece at all. This is not a work of literature. It's a summary. Um, it's not even... The, 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 the telling is not really even designed to be literary in that way, if you see what I mean by that. Um, and that's, um, that's, I think, pretty remarkable and kind of amazing when we think about the Silmarillion and how wonderful, how ravishing in places the Silmarillion is. Um, and yet to, to sort of see the, this kind of kernel um, that, it, uh, that it grows from. James, I agree with you, James Lubeck says that he was struck this time through by how the level of detail in the sketch increases when we get to the great tales like Baron and Luthien and the Children of Hurin. Um, it seems like the tension between summary and detail goes all the way back. Yeah, I do think, James, we can see him get kind of drawn into the storytelling a little bit more, though I would say that's much more noticeable when he gets to the Turin story, because, of course, remember, the Turin story is this, the whole point, it's the premise of this entire summary, right? Because it's accompanying the lay of the children of, of, of Hurin. So he wants his reader to know that whole story in outline, so they're prepared to read the poem on it. It's like a an abstract, essentially. Um but but a much more detailed abstract there uh, than uh, uh, than 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 elsewhere. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, I'll stop talking about what we're gonna the the work that we're gonna uh, talk about tonight and start looking at them. Um, but just a, a brief reminder. Um, my goal here, as before, I don't want to get too bogged down in mere differences. That is simply. Look at what he says here. It is different than what he said in the Book of Lost Tales, and different too from what he will eventually put in the, you know, what Christopher will eventually put in the published Silmarillion. Um, of course, we're going to do some of that inevitably, but Christopher is quite good at that. Um, what I want to be doing, as we've done before, is uh, look at, you know, what are the trends? How is this story shifting? What is the significance? You know, what do we learn uh, from a lot of these changes? What kind of how is the story itself developing? Sort of in these uh, kind of more general terms that I would like to that I would like to use. Um, yeah, yeah. Adam um, uh, Page makes an interesting point. He says, "I was struck that the plot seems to have preceded the themes, e.g., the danger of presumptive creation and ideas around subcreation." Um, yeah, Adam, you're right. I agree. Um, and I think that that's an important point. And actually, that again strikes me as very, um, very Tolkienian, really. Um, Tolkien people, anyone who reads Tolkien's stories and feels that Tolkien's too 
sort of moralistically heavy handed and you know I've heard some people say like oh I feel like it's just trying to you know s- sort of make a moral point um no he's not, that's not how Tolkien thinks um I mean you know if you have that impression you have that impression I don't know what to say um but that's not how Tolkien thinks and Adam you can see for in exactly that way when you go back and look at these things you can see how that emerges right he's telling these stories they're stories first and it's like the significance of those stories only occurs to him after a while. He eventually sees the pattern in these stories and brings that out a little bit more clearly down the road. Um, but I agree with you, Adam. I don't think that... Uh, and the story of Fanor, we'll, we'll, we're going to look at Fanor a couple times tonight. Um, you know, you read the published Silmarillion, and the story of Fanor is, seems very clearly to be, you know, so, you know sort of the, the danger of the position of the sub-creator, right? I mean, Fanor is like a cautionary tale. Less so, originally, right? We get a lot of these elements um, in the story of, of Fanor, but they're, they're, they, they, that emphasis... And certainly clustered with other things, like the parallel between that and, um, you know, Aule's near fall and and, uh, Melkor's actual fall and uh, issues with Sauron and all these things. You know, those things, they're certainly not clustered together. We don't, you know, some of them don't even really exist at all. Sauron's fall, for instance. Um, I mean, you know, the Lord of Wolves is the Lord of Wolves. Um, Better than the uh, King of Cats, I suppose. But um, uh, anyway... Um, yeah, Karita, exactly. Not heavy-handed like uh, Lewis or MacDonald. Um, exactly. Yeah, uh, both Lewis and MacDonald were both... Uh, well, MacDonald sort of a moralist first, Lewis a teacher first. Um, it, it, that's the, it was the sort of the main conclusion I drew the last time I did my Lewis and Tolkien class. You can see it so clearly when you put their, um, their stories side by side. Um, Lewis has the soul of a teacher. He has... Uh, you know his 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 he uses his stories um, as wonderful and powerful ways to explain things and show things, um, and they're wonderful that way. Um, that's not how, and it's not why Tolkien uh, uh, does things. Um, uh, sorry, sorry, Arthur. I don't mean to diss Tavildo. Actually, I kind of do. Tavildo's a jerk, but that's okay. Um, anyway, so uh, so let's um, let's. Let's move ahead here. Let's actually start. It is time. Yes, it is time for slide number one. Uh, before we jump into the, um, before we jump into the sketch, however, I do want to look at a couple passages too. Passages from those early fragments that we get in the very brief chapter one uh, of this book. Those fragments which come um, in between the uh, uh, the the. Book of Lost Tales and the sketch of the mythology. Um, here's the. This is the beginning of the f- of the first one that we get. Then said Ilfiniel, son of Bronweg, know that Olmo, Lord of Waters, f- forgot never the sh- sorrows of the elfin kindreds beneath the power of Melko, but he might do little because of the anger of the other gods who shut their hearts against the race of the gnomes and dwelt behind the veiled hills of Valinor, heedless of the outer world. So deep was their ruth and regret for the death of the two trees. Nor did any save Olmo only dread the... Sorry, coming again. Nor did any save Olmo only dread the power of Melko that wrought ruin and sorrow over all the earth. But Olmo desired that Valinor should gather all its might to quench his evil ere it be too late. And him seemed that both purposes might perchance be achieved if messengers from the gnomes should win to Valinor and plead for pardon and for pity upon the earth, for the love of Pelurian and Orame her son for those wide realms did but slumber still. Yet hard and evil was the road from the outer earth to Valinor, and the gods themselves had meshed the ways with magic and veiled the encircling hills. Thus did Olmo seek unceasingly to stir the gnomes to send messengers unto Valinor, but Melko was cunning and very deep in wisdom, and unsleeping was his wariness in all things that touched the elfin kindreds, and their messengers overcame overcame not the perils and temptations of that longest and most evil of all roads, and many that dared to set forth were lost forever. Okay. Um... So, um, 
what do you see here? First of all, one observation I would make, and I'd be, I'd be really interested to hear your observations, what struck you about this passage. Um, just again, thinking about, like, as I said before, oh, what kind of story is this? Um, the first thing that we notice, this is a fragment, but I feel pretty confident about what pile of paper I'd put this fragment onto, right? That is to say, this is not a piece like the sketch of the mythology. This is a book of lost tales kind of thing. Right? You see that? Um, and this is actually a, a pretty good illustration of the kind of thing that I was talking about, about the, the sort of the narrative difference between the sketch of the mythology and the Book of Lost Tales that came before. The, the reason in which I think that they are uh, um, just fundamentally different in their entire narrative approach. Notice that we get a narrator at the beginning. Then said Elfiniol, son of Bronweg, know that Olmo, lord of waters. That's a classic... Uh, Lost Tales style opening, right? We get the elven narrator who's uh, uh, who's speaking, right? And it's even Bronweg's uh, son, right? So uh, somebody who's actually connected um, with uh, with the events, um, you know, a, a little removed, but uh, but still has a link. Um, but again, that 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 opening. Know that the Lord, that Olmo, Lord of Waters, forgot never the sorrows. Um, uh, again, class, classic uh, Lost Tales style, uh, Lost Tales style opening, um, and even again, you think about the sort of the transitions between ideas. Thus did Olmo seek unceasingly, right? Um, uh, it has the flow, it has the rhetorical patterns of so not only somebody who is speaking, but somebody who is speaking in a very formal kind of. Uh, declamatory it's storytelling but not a it's not a children's storytelling right this is a this is the performance of somebody who probably uses formal gestures and things right it's it's a very uh, um, a very sort of stylized rhetorical performance as were you know that was the tone of the lost tales uh, quite a bit it's not these were not casual stories um, but uh, okay um but anyway, so apart from that uh, sort of stylistic observation, which again seems to me to kind of classify these fragments, these are Lost Tales-ish fragments. Um, I don't know why, where they came from. Christopher doesn't know where they came from. You know, we don't really know um, what was the point of them. You know, was this Tolkien sitting down and saying, I'm going to redo this particular story? Um, you know, so was this part of an effort to go back and, and, and polish up and finish up the Lost Tales? No idea. We don't know. Um, was this an earlier draft? Who knows? But okay. Um, what do we what do we see? To me, I find most striking, um, uh, good, as several of you are pointing out, the attitude of the Valar, this depiction of the Valar. It's another very Lost Tales-y kind of thing. Um, the way that the Valar are depicted as emotional, uh, right? Kind of impulsive, almost irresponsible, I would say. Uh, Mick says the emotional pain of the gods uh, seems uh, 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 overly severe. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. Peter Ribsky says that uh, he's struck by their attitude, the, their antipathy toward the gnomes that seem to work with Melko to keep messengers from reaching the shores of Valinor. I agree, Peter. There's this sense, right, that uh, it's almost impossible for any of the Noldor to get back to Valinor uh, in order to ask for their pity, right? Um, in order to petition them and try to move them to have mercy uh, and to show pity uh, for the elves who are in Mid-Earth. It's almost impossible that they'd ever be able to succeed in that. Um, why will not? Because the Valar aren't likely to have pity, right? Rather, because the road has been made almost impassable. Because, Peter, exactly as you say, if they get past the creatures of Melkor, they're not going to get past the creatures... Of, they're not going to get past the Valar, right? Between Melkor and the Valar, they've, the two of them have combined to make the road almost unachievable. But yet, notice, Aule's whole point... Or, not Aule, Olmo's whole point is that he knows, or he suspects, if he can just get one of them past, right? If he can contrive a way to sneak one of the Noldor into Valinor somehow, they'll probably will have pity, right? Again, it's, it just shows how sort of emotionally unstable they are. I mean, had they turned their faces against the Noldor and would not relent, they'd be jerks. 
Um, but, you know, they'd be consistent jerks, at least, right? Um, they might be lofty and unapproachable and not very friendly, um, but that's not what we get, right? Instead, we get the Valar who are really upset, um, both upset at the Noldor and really upset about what happened about the trees, such that they can't even really be bothered about Middle-earth at all, but if somebody were to come, you know, they, but, you know, if you, you get, like, an actual, you know, member of the Noldoli standing there and, like, making puppy dog eyes on them, they're going to melt, right? Because that's what the Valar do, right? I, that, that, that's, that kind of picture of the Valar is very dear. Both sides. I mean, every side of that. They're the, being so consumed by grief, right? They're... Um, their their wrath their you know the, this this uh, uh, sort of heated um, uh, react emotional reaction uh, to the Noldor the ease with which however they're likely to be won over anyway despite their resolutions the uh, I almost want to say pettiness of their ignoring Middle Earth right this is not just remember there are lots of questions at many points many people in Middle Earth in later ages, wonder, are the Valar still around? Is anybody watching? Does anybody care? Are we just left on our own, right? It's a question that gets voiced uh, by a lot of people. Well, in this version, in this fragment, uh, we see, uh, no, no, actually they're not really paying attention, and most of them don't even really care, right? Um, uh, yeah, Yana, vengeful is a word that I would use. They do seem almost vengeful uh, against uh, against um, the uh, uh, the gnomes. Um, yeah, <laughs> Karita says, kind of like my theory that if I snuck the baby cat into my bedroom, my parents wouldn't have the heart to throw it out. Exactly, Karita. Almost sounds almost like that, right? Right. Like if I just bring the puppy home, my parents will totally let me keep it because they can say no, you can't have a puppy. But if I already have a puppy, right, they're not going to actually take the puppy and physically throw it out the door, right? That seems it's just like that. That that's almost plan. Right? If I can just get one of them here, you know, uh, uh, it's all it's all going to work out. Um, and Nancy, but you're right. Um, Nancy Fosberg says, I'm a little uncomfortable with Oma's willingness to send gnomes toward Valinor only to have them die on the way. Yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's like the puppy thing, except in, with this horrible version of the puppy plan, uh, which involves like the, the untimely death of hundreds of puppies before one puppy finally succeeds in getting into the house, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's both... A uh, there's something kind of childlike about the plan, and yet R- ruthless itself. Uh, you know, he 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 has Ruth. Um, uh, you know, th- th- there's this, but he he he's his uh, compassion for the gnomes. Uh, Nancy, you might say, takes a kind of peculiar form in that way. Um, yeah, yeah. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, Arthur, it's another pro dog uh analogy, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um Yeah. Um Okay, so uh um Oh and uh, good question, Robert uh Special asks, how are we supposed to interpret the description of Melko as deep in wisdom? Uh, as as uh, uh equivalent with cunning? Uh it's an interesting choice. Yes, wisdom um doesn't just mean. I mean, it's it's. I would connect the way in which he's using the word wisdom there with Saruman's name. Um, uh, Saruman is a it's an Anglo-Saxon word, and it means. Uh, the, it means a, 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 a cunning man, a clever man, a craftsman, an artisan, somebody who does like a, an inventor, somebody who does clever things with his hands, um, a person who is skillful. Um, that's what Saruman's name means. Uh, again, it's, as I said, it's an Anglo-Saxon word. Um, but there's that sense when we talk about uh, uh, so Saruman's wisdom. Okay, but wise man is one other way to translate that word as well. Um, but it's that kind of wisdom, um, the, uh, 
which is more associated with skill and cunning um, than how we normally use uh, the word uh, uh, the word the word wisdom. Um, so that's a that's a that's a good way. Cunning and very deep in wisdom. Um, yes, yes. Um, yeah, good. Um, Mick, I agree that the role of Olmo seems largely unchanged, but um, a lot more extreme, right? There's more. I mean, I I sort of jokingly uh, uh, called this slide Olmo contra mundum uh, because he is uh, he's a loner. He's still in the published Silmarillion. He's a contrarian voice in the Council of the Valar, still in the published Silmarillion. Um, but this is like he's completely on a different wavelength from everybody else. Um, the way in which Olmo is sort of himself in his own will, single-handedly opposing and uh, opposing the will of the rest of the Valar and really manipulating the rest of them in this almost condescending way. Um, I think um, uh, it's... Um, uh, that I find quite remarkable. Olmo's role was absolutely enormous. I mean, he's the main character among the Valar um, in uh, in these early stories. Um, when we can see, and we can see that in the Fall of Gondolin stuff, especially um, this. It's more the, that that's where we've seen that most clearly before is uh, in the Book of Lost Tales, Fall of Gondolin. Um. Okay, let's look at let's look at the next passage that I wanted to look at. This is a, I wanted to look at the depiction of Feanor in the second fragment. Um, and this is the one which describes their arrival in Middle Earth. Um, now it happened on a while that Feanor got him beyond the hills that girt Dorloman in those parts, northward of changed to beyond Artenor. Remember, Artenor is what will later be called Doriath. Where there were open, uh, open, empty lands and treeless hills, and he had no small company, and three of his sons were with him. Thus came they on a day nigh evening to a hilltop, and afar off descried a red light leaping in a vale open on that side that looked towards them. Then Fanor wondered what this fire might be, and he and his folk marched in the still night swiftly thereto, so that ere dawn they looked down into that vale. There saw they an armed company no less than their own, and they sat around a mighty fire of wood. The most were asleep, but some few stirred, and Fanor stood then up and called in his clear voice, so that the dark veil rang, Who be ye, men of the gnomes, or other what? Say swiftly, for tis best for you to know the children of Fanor compass you around. Um, what do we see here? What do we notice? What's Now, again, here I want to think about some of the differences. Um, what is this parallel to in the published Silmarillion? Um, there is a sort of parallel event. It's not very closely parallel, but what occupies the same... Where are we? Do you remember where we are, where it seems like we are in the overall narrative here in this moment? What's about to happen? This is not the finding of men. In fact, those uh, Christopher suggests, and it seems to me quite likely, that those are orcs that they're finding, not men at all. Um, and they have no idea. They, this is their first encounter with orcs. Um, uh, yeah, good. You've got it, um, uh, Robert. R exactly right. This is uh, this is this is this is the death of Fanor. Um, remember in the published Silmarillion, so Feanor and his sons and their people arrive first and they burn the ships and strand Fingolfin and, and everybody else. And then um, they're, they, they're, they're there by the lake, right? By, by Mithrim, they're in Dor Loman, and the orcs discover them and they have this great battle. And, well, I mean, if they had the Nullor, think it's great anyway. Um, and they, uh, they defeat the orcs kind of easily and Feanor is charging off and he's like, I'm going to win. I'm going to get the Silmarils back immediately. And he thinks he's just going to, he's just going to mop the floor uh, with Morgoth right away. Uh, and he pursues them and the Balrogs surround him and kill him. Right. Um, so it's that moment with the, the so this, this is the, the conflict that we're, uh, that, that, that is being initiated. The fragment 
shuts off, right? It cuts off before we get to the uh, the place where, you know, was Fanor going to die here? Christopher Tolkien thinks so, that this was probably uh, going to be... This, this is the opening moves of what's going to be the battle where uh, Fanor is going to be mortally wounded. That seems quite likely. Um, so, think. Similarities and differences. I quoted this... I chose this paragraph to discuss in more detail because I want to focus on the character of Fanor. I want to try to understand who is this Fanor guy? And I mean this Fanor guy, not the other Fanor guy. right? Not the guy in the published Silmarillion. Not even the guy in the Book of Lost Tales. Who's this guy? What do we learn about this Fanor dude that we meet, uh, that we meet here? Um, he's brash, Mick, I agree. I agree. Yeah, not extremely discerning, or perhaps really ugly. Mick, again, he thinks the orcs look like him or something, right? But, uh, uh, but anyway, brash. I think is a good word. But notice, Mick, we wouldn't call the Fanor in the published Silmarillion brash, right? I mean, you might, but he's not just brash, right? It would be, an, it would be a pretty big understatement to read Fanor from the published Silmarillion and be like, he's a little brash, right? That's um, that's not uh, a sufficient explan or description of uh, of of Fanor from uh, as he's going to eventually become Cheryl Good. He seems noble and commanding, um, even honorable. Cheryl, I mean, he's obviously not afraid of them, right? He challenges them, um, and you know, know the children of Fanor compass you around. He's giving them this challenge. He doesn't know who they are. Um, he he he's making this. It, it, it's an aggressive speech, right? So he's not he's not kindly, but he is warning them, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, Karita, that's yeah. Fanor in the published Silmarillion is the guy who slammed the door in Morgoth's face. Yeah, exactly. He's not doing. He's not doing that yet. Um, that element, even in the sketch of the mythology, as you may remember, you know, in the, the later text, which we're coming to, we really are. Um, he, we, we don't get that moment of um, the, his, the confrontation between Fanor and Morgoth at Formanos and him slamming the door in Morgoth's face. Um, so we um, we don't see that. But Krita, it's exactly that element, right? The kind of crashing arrogance that leads him first to think that, like, he's just going to slam the door in Morgoth's face, and then he's going to come and he, he thinks he's defeated Morgoth in one quick battle, right? Um, which, you know, arrogance and overstretching of himself leads to his swift and anticlimactic death. Um, and it is deeply anticlimactic, right? I mean, he's all, um, you know, when he's uh, making his oaths and and uh, you know making his speeches back in Tyrion, uh, Tyrion in the published Silmarillion, um, he's uh, you know he sounds he sounds all he sounds as arrogant as Captain Ahab, right? I would s smite the sun if it offended me. Um, uh, actually, I always thought that would be an interesting kind of comparison between. Melville's Ahab and, and Feanor. Um, but um, uh, d d this isn't that, right? We don't get that that element. The, the megalomania, uh, even, that I think uh, Feanor shows in the published Silmarillion, we don't really see that very clearly here. Um, yeah, and uh, Cheryl, I agree, uh, he's not obviously fallen. Um, in this same uh, in this same way, I agree. I agree. Um, uh, yeah. So Fanor is in these earlier in this earlier story. Fanor is a smaller character, smaller in his own attitude. Right, um, not uh, not nearly as, uh, as as sort of overwhelmed with his own importance. He's also um, less central. Remember earlier on, he's described as um, uh, he's he's described as as not even actually part of the royal family. He's just the 
the great the greatest of the gem makers of the Noldor. Um, so he's not the son of Finway, um, you know, at at at, at one early stage. Um, yeah, Tom, he's not quite a legend in his own mind yet. Um, no, no, he's not. He's not, re- again, other than the fact that he was the greatest of the gem makers, he's not a legend at all, really. Um, so, th- you know, it's interesting to see, again, thinking about, it's so, it's so tempting to, you know, Feanor is such a, a huge, you know, larger-than-life character in the published Silmarillion. It would be easy to think, right, to pick up the Silmarillion and think, like, okay, this is basically the story of Feanor, right? I mean, you know, the Silmarils are in the title, and and uh, you know, and Feanor is this enormous character. Um, it would be very natural to read that book and think, so this is basically the story of Feanor, and then it kind of grew around that. But we can see, no, actually, that's not really how it worked at all. That's not where Feanor came from, and I find it I find it kind of interesting. And Yana, I agree, he is even smaller here than he was uh, in uh, in the Lost Tales. Yeah, um, it does seem that if anything, um, if we can, if if this is indeed a progression from the Lost, if this is in fact, as Christopher thinks, written after the Lost Tales and before the sketch. Uh, he seems, at least briefly, to have been getting smaller. And then Tolkien decided when he wrote the sketch uh, to make him kind of bigger again. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, good. Robert, that's a good way to say it. He comes off as, as uh, like an explorer in this passage, brash but not evil. Yes. Uh, Gwendolyn, good question. Gwendolyn Gaunt says... Um, that it's very interesting how Tolkien says men of the gnomes. Uh, does he use that sort of description in later text, um, or does he cut out the you know the sort of does he uh, keep using the word man in this way? Gwendolyn, you can see him using the word men in this kind of a generic sense, just meaning like gnomish dudes, um, just as a completely generic noun, not specifically about humans, but just meaning guys. Um, you can see this even in the Hobbit. He's still confusingly uses, uh, uh, confusing to many, uses the word men to describe elves. Um, uh, as, for instance, the, the phrase repeated at least twice, uh, the raftmen of the king, meaning the, uh, the elves uh, who were, do, who were uh, uh, paddling the rafts of barrels uh, down the river, who are obviously, from the context of their discussion with the uh, the master of Lake Town, um, when Thorin shows up at Lake Town, and the raftmen of the elves jump up and say, hey, this guy was imprisoned by our king. They're obviously elves, but they're called raftmen. Um, that was pretty common. In fact, uh, Tolkien even used the word man to describe Bilbo several times in ways which, uh, um, which were... Uh, one of his readers sort of famously called him on it and said, like, why are you calling him a man? He's not a man, he's a hobbit, right? And and Tolkien was like, yeah, that's what I meant, but okay, whatever. And so he kind of stopped doing that. Um, so that was... Um, um, uh, so that, But you're right, Sarah Lagarde, Eowyn is no man. So yes, this, the semantics end there. Um, but yeah, he did... So special, but re- remember, this is during that same period that he wrote The Hobbit. Um, he was still doing that kind of thing a lot, using the word man in that way. And you can see a bunch of examples of it, actually, um, in the sketch, um, when he's using the word men generically in referring to, uh, to, to elves. Just So when he uses the word men uncapitalized, usually... You can just replace that with a, you know, in your mind, with a, a modern generic like guys or dudes or folk or people. Um, that's um, that's generally how it works at this stage uh, of his writing. Um, all right, let's actually get into the sketch here and uh, look at a few things that I found really striking. Um, we'll, I was I was about to say. Uh, we won't necessarily spend that long on each passage, but uh, I know better even to say that because you won't believe me anyway. So, all right, from the first section of the sketch, uh, this is the description of the two trees. And as usual, as I'm reading, go ahead and uh, start, you know, type some observations, the things that strike you and what you notice. Be really interested to hear your own impressions. Um, uh, you know, as I'm reading, and, and you know, before I uh, before I give my own comments. Ivan Balaurin, that's 
Yavanna, of course, plants the two trees in the middle of the plain of Valinor, outside the gates of the city of Valmar. They grow under her songs, and one has dark green leaves with shining silver beneath, and white blossoms like the cherry from which a dew of silver light falls. The other has golden-edged leaves of young green, like the beech, and yellow blossom like the hanging blossoms of laburnum, which give out heat and blazing light. Each tree waxes for seven hours to full glory, and then wanes for seven. Twice a day, therefore, comes a time of softer light, when each tree is faint, and their light is mingled. Okay. Um, what do you notice? Arthur, great observation. Present tense. That is interesting, isn't it? Especially given the overall frame of this, right? That is to say, um, the fact that this narrative is just this plot summary narrative, right? Um, you might think that we'd do the plot summary in the past tense, right? Okay, so, uh, you know, whatever, this Valar named Yvonne Beleren planted two trees in the middle of the plain. They grew under her songs. One was dark. One had uh, The other had golden-edged uh, leaves, right? And the tree waxed for seven hours. and we, Right? That would seem natural, because you're describing briefly describing things from, from before. But as Arthur points out, that's not what we get, right? We get the present tense. Um, so that's... Uh, that's interesting. Now, Nancy, you're right. He's not consistent with that in the sketch. Um, but uh, I, one of the things that I see there is what we were talking about before, the kind of the way in which what he's writing is not li really a literary text. It's just a summary, but he does kind of get sort of drawn into it. I don't think he's really capable of, uh, of having this be completely prosy uh, in the sense of being... Uh, sort of really blunt, plain, and not really creative or expressive. Um, and I, I think that that, that that present tense is, uh, is, is, is that kind of a, um, um, a sort of uh, um, artistic touch, I think. Um, okay. Um, What else? What else do you notice? One thing that I found very striking, um, more striking here, we got a lot more detail about the trees in the Book of Lost Tales than we get in the published Silmarillion. Um, but I found the level of detail that we get in the description of the trees to be quite remarkable. In this version we can picture the trees very clearly. I mean, you'll notice how they are compared very directly to species of trees that we know and presumably have seen, right? Um, you know, we've got the, the, the dark green leaves of, uh, of the silver tree, right? Um, with white blossoms like the cherry from which a dew of silver light falls. Um, so we've got the one which is like a cherry tree and the other which has which has leaves like a beech tree and yellow blossoms, like the blossoms of laburnum, which give out heat and blazing light. So they're just like laburnum blossoms, except shining with light and blazing with heat. So, okay, yeah. Um, uh, that's, uh, yeah, Mick, they do sound like actual trees. We can really, we can really picture them. Um, and they're tied to, but it's, when I say we can picture them, I don't just mean sufficient detail of description is given for us to form a, a mental picture in our heads. Uh, yeah, there is that, but it's not just that. It's the way in which the trees are rooted in our own experience, right? Um, in this version of the description of the trees, instead of saying, begin with the concept, tree of silver, tree of gold, right? Tree of shining white light, tree of golden light. Instead of sh uh, starting with those kind of much more um, much more abstract mythic concepts, I've never actually seen a tree like those, and so I mean, honestly, my own physical picture of the trees has always been rather vague. Um, you know, the, I could just based upon the description in the published Silmarillion, um, 
I never really thought, for instance, about, like, do the, you know, the blossoms of Laurel and, um, you know, are they, do they, do they, you know, sort of hang in clusters? I never even asked myself that question, really, have to admit. Um, but we get that. But again, it's not just about that we get all this detail. It's that we get it rooted to our experience. You know, instead of saying, begin with silver tree, right, as a concept, and build upon that. Instead, we get we start with, picture a cherry tree, except this cherry tree, you know, as a picture laburnum blossoms, except these give out heat and blazing light, right? Um, in a sense, the root image is a tree, or trees that we know, or that we will have seen. Um, and uh, that's... Um, yeah, as Mick says, he, uh, he started with actual trees and then, uh, and then valorized them. Ha, 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 ha. Um, uh, exactly. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, so Cheryl, it is a little bit confusing there at the end. Uh, the tree waxes and wanes for seven hours alternately, right? They're not up at the same time. Um, and so the mingling of... So you've got like six hours when one is blooming and the other is not, and then six hours when the other is blooming and the other is not. But then you've got the, the hour um, in between which uh, in which they're, one is waxing and the other is waning, but neither one of them is... is close. That's where the seventh hour kind of comes in. Um, <clears throat> but um, anyway, so... Um, and here it does seem that the 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 day does seem to be, I think, fourteen hours long is is what we're is what we're getting here, or no, twelve because two of the they're overlapped those hours, on the ends. Um, it's a little bit confusing, but again, isn't that interesting, right? That on the one hand we get all of this very specific detail, and then numbers, right? And yet, it's not really perfectly clear uh, uh, the, you know exactly how the daily cycle works. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, and James, there's, there is not a period completely without light. There's just the, what, the hour of softer light uh, when, the two, when the two trees are mingling. Um, anyway, this impulse to root, uh, as it were, the trees in our experience in this way um, to make them I think really for just about the only time um, in Tolkien's whole mythology to make them trees first and magical second you know you get the, the magic sun and everything connected with the rebirth of the trees um, uh, in the late in the in the late parts of the sketch um, but to, ha to have them be trees first and magic second is I think pretty remarkable and a very interesting move on his part, a way in which um, he is rooting this mythology, um, this story, not in... Um, well, as I said, it's not myth first, detail second. It's sort of natural world first, myth second. Um, and that maybe that sort of suggests something about his approach to his sort of plot summary here, right? Knowing that he's doing this as plot summary here, I'm trying to give you stuff to hold on to so that you know what to picture in your mind when there are references made to the trees. Um, but anyway, it's it's in any case, in my mind, a very interesting kind of data point. Jumping ahead a little bit. Okay, so the elves are just waking up. We're not jumping ahead that much. Um, at the making of the stars, the children of Earth awake, the Eldar, or elves. They are found by Orome, dwelling by the starlit pool, Quivienin, water of awakening, in the east. He rides home to Valinor, filled with their beauty, and tells the Valar, who are reminded of their duty to the Earth. Oh, yeah, we have a duty to the earth. Man, what was I thinking? Since they came thither, knowing that their office was to govern it for the two races of earth who should after come each in appointed time. There, 
There follows an expedition to the Fortress of the North, Angband, Iron Hell, but this was, is now too strong for them to destroy. Morgoth is nonetheless taken captive and consigned to the halls of Mandos, who, dwell in the north of Va- who dwelt in the north of Valinor. The Eldalie, people of the elves, are invited to Valinor for fear of the evil things of Morgoth that still wandered in the dark. A great march is made by the Eldar from the east, led by Orome on his white horse. What do you notice here? I mean, obviously, I already paused to make a big deal of the line, which I find hilarious in this passage. They were reminded of their duty to the... Oh, yeah! We're supposed to be doing something here, aren't we? Um, and I'm not just trying to make fun of the Valar, but it, I guess that phrasing I find uh, really, really striking. It's as if they have forgotten, right? But anyway, what did they almost forget? What's their duty here? What is the point of the Valar, according to this passage? That's an interesting point, right? It seems like something we should pay attention to. What's the point of the Valar? What's the Valar's job? To govern the earth. Yes. Yes. To govern the earth. Why? To govern it for the two races of Earth who should after come, each in appointed time. Yeah, to make and care for Arda, yes. Uh, Sarah, that's a good way to say it, but, but not just for Arda. Not for Arda for its own sake, right? Not but To govern it for the two races of Earth. Doesn't it make it almost sound like that? Yeah, they're stage setters, Carita. Exactly. Um, doesn't it sound like they're maybe even kind of meant to hand over rulership, governorship over the Earth to the two races of Earth who should after come each in appointed time. It almost sounds like that way. Govern it for the two races of Earth. Like the, they're supposed to make this place for the children to dwell in. And to, you know, keep everything running and stuff so that when, in their appointed time, the, ch- the children come, the earth is is ready for them, right? Yeah, they're stewards, exactly. Rich uh, and Yana both said, and Neil all said that at the same time. Exactly, they're stewards. Um, but like stewards, hey, Denethor, we're looking at you, you're supposed to be ready to hand over, you know, to render up your stewardship when the king returns. That's... Uh, thinking about the Valar that way is a little odd, right? I mean, thinking of them as stewards is not odd. But thinking of them as stewards then yielding the world to people is a little bit odd. Um, it's exactly like an idea that we see in Lewis, actually. Remember C.S. Lewis's story that has that exactly that thing happen? Unfair question, because it's not connected to tonight's reading. Bonus points if you remember. Anybody? Give me a few seconds. Remember the C.S. Lewis work in which that happens? Angelic beings who rule the world but then hand over rulership uh, to to the creatures who get... Who get Paralandra is the correct answer. Anyway, it, but it's exactly that same idea um, that their job was to set the stage. But then it's it's the actual it's the children who were uh, supposed to come in and uh, and sort of take uh, take charge of things. Um, uh, good. Anyway, okay. So, um, uh, but but but, that, but again, that's I, I I don't know. I I can't think of any time that we get that with uh, that that image of the Valar or that sense of the purpose of elves and men, right? So okay, but but once they slap themselves on the forehead and remember, oh, that's right, duty, right? Okay, wait, let's focus, focus on the duty. Elves are coming, right? Um, We've got to, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to whip this earth into government now because we've been doing a lousy job. Um, what um, 
what comes next? What do they do with the elves and why? Of course, we know what they do. They invite them, right? They invite them over to Valinor. Why? This is different, right? Why do they invite them to the published Silmarillion? Why do the elves come? Why do they why do they bring the 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 elves over? There is an element of protection. You know, they, they want to keep them safe, but it's more positive in the published Silmarillion. That is, again, I'm asking in the published Silmarillion now. In the published Silmarillion, why do they want the elves in Valinor? Because they love them, and they want to be with them. Um, that It's just, they like, they want to hang out with the elves. Um, and they do want to make sure that they're safe, but it's it's just this pos- positive desire for them to come and join them. They want to, you know, shower blessings down upon them. Come, you know, come set up house with us, and we'll live in what the you know Valinor is the blessed realm, and it's going to be awesome, and you'll love it here, and and we want to be with you, and we want to, you know, we just want to pour love and blessing out on you. It's going to be great, right? We don't get a whiff of that here. Here, it's simply protection. That's all that's emphasized. Um, uh, For fear of the evil things of Morgoth that still wandered in the dark. Right? It's like, oh man, we've got a duty to this world, and if we let some, like, creature of horn and ivory break through and rampage across and, like, slaughter the elves, boy, are our faces going to be red after that, right? Talk about your bad performance review to the management, right? Um, we will have failed in our duty in a really big way, so let's not break the elves, let's bring them where we can keep an eye on them and make sure that they're safe, right? Um, it's, um... We don't get any sense of the positive version. Now, here I'm reminded of a disclaimer that Christopher Tolkien makes, which is an important one to keep in mind. The sketch of the mythology that we're reading here is designed to be a really short synopsis. And as Christopher Tolkien says on multiple occasions, just because something is left out, something is not said in the sketch, doesn't mean that Tolkien had rejected that as an idea. So we can't read this and say, I think Christopher Tolkien is very right to say, it, it, is, it is illogical for us to read this and say, since it doesn't say, you know, he left out saying that they brought them out of love for the children. Therefore, we can prove that in Tolkien's conception at this point, the Valar didn't love the children. Right? You know, you can't draw a positive... He may not actually have changed that story very much in his mind. He just is, doesn't have time to tell the whole story. Right? That is completely correct. But I have one quibble with that um, general sort of dictum by Christopher Tolkien here. Um, yes, it's true that we can't conclude that just because Tolkien doesn't include it, it means Tolkien meant to remove it from the story entirely. Yes, because it's a short version. But here's something we can conclude safely, I think. If Tolkien included one bit and left out another bit, you can't prove that he meant to remove the second bit entirely from the story. But you can prove that the first bit that he did include was more important to him than the second bit that he left out, right? If he's telling a really short version, and he says one thing, uh, you know, he, he emphasizes one element of the story and leaves other elements of the story out. You're right, we can't prove, that doesn't prove that those other elements are gone or not there at all, but it does show you that that one that he does say in the sketch is more important, right? Clearly. Um, and so, so here, for instance, again, we can't look at this and say, in the sketch of the mythology, the Valar don't love the elves. Uh, that's clearly not true. And yet, 
it would not have taken him any more words to say, are invited to Valinor. Uh, you know, the Eldalia are invited to Valinor um, because of the exceedingly great love that the Valar had for them. That would be the same number of words, right? Um, and, uh, you know, he could have, you know, he could possibly have said both, but even if he had to choose, even if he felt he had to choose one or the other, he chose to emphasize their fear for their safety rather than their love for him. And that that was a choice. No, nobody had a gun to his head, right? You know, he chose to emphasize that. And so, to me, that's really interesting. And it does suggest that um, we are safe in saying, at this point in the story, that was what was primary in, uh, in Tolkien's mind in explaining um, what, we're, uh, what we're seeing. Um, and yes, Adam, that's, that, is, that is correct. Uh, Adam Page says, uh, it seems that in general this isn't really a version per se, it's an outline, a description, um, where he lays motivations and plot uh, vehicles bare. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's not just a briefer story. That's what I meant when I said earlier on, this is not even really a literary piece at all. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a synopsis. It's a plot summary. It's an abstract. But again, it's you know, so I'm calling it a version, um, which you're right is is kind of sloppy. It's not exactly a version, um, well, but it, it is kind of a version of the story, um, in a different sense. But anyway, um, my point is simply what he does say, what he does choose to include, is I think you know, the more telling, um, given how spare the entire thing is. Um, yeah, it's it's an epitome, Tom, of the story. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> Cheryl uh, Cardozo, going back to the Valar here, says, it's almost like they're covering up for their neglect. Had they paid attention to the Earth before the Eldar awoke, right, it had not taken them so long to tumble to the fact that they had a duty that they'd been neglecting. Morgoth might not have gone crazy and peopled the place with evil things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe if they'd been more on the ball in the first place, they wouldn't have had to, uh, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have had to do this. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that really, that really kind of is, uh, is the sense of it. I mean, think even, even of the, the, you know, um, the thing about Angband, right? There follows an expedition to the fortress of the North, Angband, but this is now too strong for them to destroy. You doesn't have to say that, right? Um, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's a short description. Um, he says Morgoth is taken captive, but he puts that in second place. Right before he says Morgoth is nonetheless taken captive, right? Well, they did manage to take Morgoth captive, but the first thing he chooses to emphasize is Angband is too strong for them to destroy. Not they failed to destroy it completely. Not they left the job kind of undone. <clears throat> not you know they destroyed ninety percent of it, but some of it escaped their notice. No, it was too strong for them to destroy. The, it emphasizes the weakness of the Valar, right? They do. They do capture Morgoth, though, right? So you know, it wasn't a complete loss. Um, but uh, but anyway, that's kind of um, it's um, the way in which the story emphasizes kind of the weakness of the of the Valar in that way too. I think is is interesting. Anyway, we're ripping through slides tonight. Gonna, we're gonna we're gonna totally. I'm not totally not telling you. How many sides we have? Okay, the God, the gods were not, it's Morgoth's motives, right? We're looking at Morgoth now when he's being released. The gods were now beguiled by Morgoth, who, having passed seven ages in the prisons of Mandos and gradually lightened pain, came before the conclave of the gods in due course. He looks with greed and malice upon the Eldar, who also sit there about the knees of the gods and lusts especially after the jewels. He dissembles his hatred and desire for revenge. He is allowed a humble dwelling in Valinor, and after a while goes freely about Valinor, only Ilmir foreboding ill, while Tulkas the Strong, who first captured him, watches him. Morgoth helps the Eldar in many deeds, but slowly poisons their peace with lies. He suggests that the gods brought them to Valinor out of jealousy, for fear of their marvelous skill and magic and beauty should grow too strong for them outside in the world. The, the, the Kendi and Teleri are little moved, 
but the Noldoli, the wisest of the elves, become affected. They begin at whiles to murmur against the gods and their kindred. They are filled with vanity of their skill. Um, Sarah, yes, yeah, Sarah Lagarde says, isn't the relative weakness of the Valar also a feature of the Book of Lost Tales presentation of the story? Yes. Um, I'm not sure, Sarah, that it's not even more extreme in this version. At least in some moments it sounds more extreme to me um, than it was before. But that in itself is, to me, a point of interest, because we're not getting this smooth increase of sort of the stature of the Valar from the Book of Lost Tales to the published Silmarillion, they're still kind of questionable. Um, speaking of questionable, Arthur... Um, yeah, Arthur asks the uh, uh, uncomfortable question, were the gods torturing Morgoth? Uh, diminished, pa diminishing pain across the seven ages of captivity. Um, yeah, except for instead of tightening the screws, they were loosening the screws as time went by. So, you know, yeah, that's okay, right? It's better. Um, they had them on the rack and they were, they were, you know, they were slacking it off uh, over the years until it was, uh, until it was fine. Right? Um, uh, I don't know what to do with that in gradually lightening lightened pain does that mean that he was being tortured i don't think that it's inescapable to read it that way i mean it could be simply a description of how like he was really suffering at being imprisoned that is to say that like you could potentially i think read this as an expression of when Melkor was first imprisoned, he was completely he completely lost it. Like it was an, it was an incredible torment to him to be imprisoned, but he got over it eventually. Like as time went by, he kind of adjusted, you know, uh, until by the end he was like, "I'm fine, I'm fine," right? Um, and not actively uh, actively torturing him. Um, exactly, exactly, Yana. His uh, um, his sort of the knowledge of his imprisonment. Uh, tortured him um, uh, sort of mentally or psychologically. Possible. Possible. Yeah, Peter the uh, uh, Peter saying it seems uh, remarkable that the Noldor, the Noldoli here are referred to as the wisest yet succumbed to the lies of Morgoth while their apparently more dim-witted cousins are a little moved. Here again, the wisdom is like the wisdom of Morgoth, right? They are more cunning. They are more skillful. Um, that seems to be their their the sense in which they are the wisest of the elves. Um, this, even more than the other usage, strikes me as a much more um, usage of the sense of wisdom in that in that Anglo-Saxon sense. Um, uh, cunning, resourceful, um, skilled with their hands, uh, inventive. Uh, they're wisest in that sense. And this leads not to a kind of wisdom which would bring, um, you know, humility and a clear perspective on things. Um, instead, it's the kind of wisdom, skill, which leads to vanity of their skill, right, as we see. Um, yeah, and Cheryl was, ask, was, uh, was talking about that, too. Um, yeah, good. Gwen Gwendolyn points out that uh, Melkor looks with greed upon the Eldar. Um, she asks, is this uh, part of his desire to have his own race to govern and to be worshipped by? Yes. Yeah, I think, Gwendolyn, I think the word greed is what's really, um, what's really significant there. Um, he, um, he, I mean, greed, uh, I mean, it's like the desire for money, right? He, he, he desires... He looks upon the Eldar not only with malice, that is, desire to cause them suffering, um, but also with, with desire, the kind of desire which is like greed, possessiveness. Um, he wants to own the elves. Um, and notice he's seeing them sitting about the knees of, of the gods, right? He's, he's them sitting around and like worshipping the other gods and, and loving on them and everything, and he's like, no, no, I want them. I, I, I want to rule. I want to be the one that people are sitting around and admiring. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Okay, good. Um, oh, good. Rich was just asking about the word wise, too. Yeah, good. Um, yes, good. Peter, yes, you're right that uh, Olmo still seems to be the only one of the Valar who understands <clears throat> what's really going on. Only Ilmir, uh, Olmo, is foreboding ill, right? Olmo is the only one who's like, am I the only one here who thinks this is a bad idea? Answer, yes. Yes, Olmo, you're the only one who thinks that this is a bad idea. Um, uh, uh, good, but and so notice how his own um, his own desires... Um, so we see him, uh, he see him lusting after the, the, the jewels as well. There seems to be a kind of a parallel there, right? His attitude towards the jewels is kind of like his attitude, it seems, towards the Eldar, except he also feels malice towards the Eldar, not only greed. Um, yeah, yeah, good. Um, notice how much more insidious the lies of Morgoth are in this, uh, in this description. Um, he suggests that the gods brought them to Valinor out of jealousy, for fear of their marvelous skill, magic, and for fear their marvelous skill, magic, and beauty should grow too strong for them outside in the world. It's almost as if, like the Valar had governed, you know, were supposed to govern the world until the elves came, and then they were supposed to pass governorship of the world off to the elves. But instead, they're like, "No, why don't you leave the world and come and?" spend your time talking about how awesome we are. Or why don't you come over here and like worship us? And then we'll just kind of keep... The world can keep going the way that it is, right? Um, in other words, the lies of Melkor here are not just targeted to kind of... Uh, are not just calculated to um, kind of get to the elves. They really do seem to strike right at kind of the root of the... Uh, Potential problem here. That I, as I said, I think they're much more, uh, they're much more insidious. Um, yeah, Tom, I agree. Especially in this uh, in this version, Tom Hillman is saying uh, Olmo uh, has a bit of Cassandra about him. That is the one who is prophesying the doom that will come, but nobody believes her. Um, uh, yeah, Olmo's a little bit like that, right? Um, you think, Tom, uh, you know, of uh, Omo and the Turin story, right? Omo and with uh, Gondolin, nobody ever listens to Omo. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, good, good. Um, yeah, see, Mick, that's interesting. Mick is thinking about jealous gods. Um, and uh, the, the yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, think about this. The word jealous... Is, uh, is really important. Brought them to Valinor out of jealousy. Now, think carefully about what this means, because the word jealousy is an important word. Um, and it's important because it... Um, I, I, I don't think that word means what you think it means. Uh, that is to say, we use the word jealousy in a different sense in which it was traditionally used. Um, we use the word jealous as if it were a synonym of the word envious. Um, like we w would look at somebody who's driving a much nicer car than we are and say, I'm jealous of your car. No, you're not jealous of that person's car. You are envious of that person's car. And that's actually a, co a totally different thing than being jealous. Um, when you uh, have a really nice car yourself and you won't let anybody else ride in it or drive it because you're afraid they're going to scratch it or do something bad to it, you are jealous of your own car then. That's what jealousy is. Jealousy is the desire to protect that which you have. Envy is when you desire what somebody else has. Okay, they're different impulses completely. Um, this is why, um, so yes, Arthur, when God in the Old Testament says, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, he's not saying, I want what other people have. When God says to the Israelites, I am a jealous God, what he is saying, and you can see it very clearly in the context there in the Ten Commandments, he is saying, I won't share you 
with others. I am jealous of you. You are my chosen people, and I'm not going to share you. You will have no other gods. You will make no graven images. Why? Because I am a jealous God. I want you all to myself. Okay? That's what God is saying when he's calling himself a jealous God. Um, so, yes, Feanor is jealous of the Silmarils. Exactly. Feanor's attitude towards the uh, 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 When Melkor looks at Feanor with the Silmarils and desires them, he's not jealous. He's, he might be envious. He is certainly greedy. Uh, uh, he is even something like lustful, not in a sexual sense, in a metaphorical sense. He lusts after the jewels. He desires them, that is to say. That's what the word lust means, after all. Um, but uh, so, so anyway, so the word jealousy here, coming back to this context here then. Um, the gods brought them to Valinor out of jealousy. For fear their marvelous skill, magic and beauty should grow too strong for them outside in the world. So what is Morgoth accusing the Valar of being jealous of? Do you see what I mean? Out of jealousy? Out of jealousy for what? See what I mean? Yes, James, I think so. Jealous of the world. Yes. No, not sharing the elves with the rest of the world. Sharing the world with the elves. Right? The gods brought them to Valinor out of jealousy for fear their marvelous skill, magic, and beauty should grow too strong for them outside in the world. The elves might have become rivals of the Valar. They might have become a threat to the Valar. They, the Valar, are jealous of their governance of the world. They don't want to share the world with the elves. That's why they took the elves out of the world and brought them here where they can control them and keep them down, right? So that they, the Valar, can retain control over the world and keep the elves subjected and subordinated. And you see how much more calculated of a lie this is because it kind of looks like that. And what's more, it strikes at the root of what the Valar themselves are supposed to be doing. It's exploiting the way, the particular way in which the Valar have kind of screwed up by bringing the elves, 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 in, in, in. They're not, they were, they, they were supposed to do. They were supposed to be like, okay, the world is yours now. How can we help? Right? That's not what they did. Instead, they said, why don't you come over here and let's just leave the world be for now, right? Um, the story in the published Silmarillion works differently, right? There, when because since the Valar are bringing the elves to Valinor primarily out of love, the lies of Morgoth are twisting that which is a beautiful thing into something ugly, right? Um, that you might think they brought you here out of love, but really they're just trying to keep you down, Right, um, that is a, in a sense, a more horrible lie, because it's twisting something which is really beautiful. But that's not the dynamic here. We don't get something beautiful that's misunderstood and twisted. Instead, we get what seems to be a pretty plain screw up, and Morgoth seizing advantage of that screw up in order to turn it into an accusation which is really quite plausible, and not even necessarily a hundred percent wrong. Still a bit a big percentage wrong, but not a hundred percent wrong. Um yeah, yeah. Anyway, okay. Um let's keep going. Um the business about men humans, that is, uh not dudes uh, humans going to the halls of Mandos. Uh, so you'll remember in the text, or initially, he said that men don't go to Mandos, and then he changed his mind and rewrote that passage in the notes at the end of the passage. Christopher Tolkien says about how he, he added this bit. Um, so, they went to the halls of Mandos, but not the same as the halls of awaiting where the elves were sent. There they, were, there they too waited, but it was said that only Mandos knew whether they went after the time in his halls. They were never reborn on earth, and none ever came back from Mandos, save only Baron, son of Barahir, who thereafter spoke not to mortal men. Their fate after death was perchance not in the hands of the Valar. Hmm. 
we don't have to talk about this one too long. I, I wanted to spotlight this because I find this one really interesting. Um, just thinking about, for, for the glimpse that it gives us of um, just kind of the, the sort of uh, uh, metaphysics of Tolkien's mythology at this particular stage. Now, perhaps I shouldn't have talked about this because this is a really big topic, but um, when you look at the early stuff, what we get here in the sketch, what we saw in the Book of Lost Tales, it's easy, you could easily make two contradictory arguments about the metaphysics of Tolkien's world. On the one hand, if you wanted to say, Tolkien is clearly sort of representing in almost allegorical form uh, sort of the Catholic doctrine of hell, heaven, and purgatory um, in the fates of, uh, you know, the creatures within his world. You could make that argument. Um, that, uh, that seems to work, actually. But you can also make almost exactly the opposite argument and say, um, we can see in the metaphysics which he eventually comes to about how men leave the circles of the world and the elves don't know what comes of them. And uh, especially by the time you get to uh, um, to the uh, uh, the Andreth story, to the to the uh, the Athrabeth um, in Morgoth's Ring. This debate between, uh, sort of historical debate, between Finrod Felagund and the wise woman Andreth, sort of debating the metaphysics of elves and men and what happens to their souls. By the time we get there, we see something which is explicitly, not just explicitly compatible, not just compatible with, but explicitly linked to, uh, to Christian theology. Um, I, I mean, it's it's the only. I mean, there's this actual reference to tying Iluvatar to the Incarnation later on. I mean, there's, it actually alludes not to Jesus by name, because Jesus of Nazareth was not historically uh, 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 not historically happening yet, but the, but the concept of the Incarnation, the, <clears throat> that Iluvatar is going to uh, uh, to become mortal and enter into the world. I mean, it's 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 the 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 compatibility of the metaphysics of Middle Earth with Christian doctrine is at its most explicit there in the Athrobath later on. Um, here it's much less so, I think. And it's interesting to me to see here how we see him kind of toying with this and sort of trying to sort this out and find ways to kind of make this work, thinking about the de what is the destiny of of elvish souls and, and how are humans different. And so they, they the humans do go to Mandos, um, one wonders, and with the reference of Baron, to Baron son of Barahir, one even almost wonders whether it's Baron son of Barahir which necessitates, from a plot standpoint, the human halls set apart in Mandos, right? Because um, if they leave the circles of the world entirely, how does Baron come back, right? But uh, anyway, I, I think this is a really kind of interesting stage where we can see we can see it kind of working both ways uh, in uh, in some sense. Let's, uh, let's look at the eagles. Manway, to whom birds bring news upon Timbrinting of all things which his far-sighted eyes do not see upon earth, fashions the race of eagles and sends them under their king Thorndor to dwell in the crags of the north and watch Morgoth. The eagles dwell out of reach of Orc and Balrog on account of how Balrogs can't fly having no wings. Therefore, the eagles can dwell in the crags of Thangarodrim, right above the Balrogs, making faces down at them and sticking out their uh, avian tongues at the Balrogs because there's not a bit of a thing that the Balrogs can possibly do about it. Anyway, out of reach of Orc and Balrog and our great foes of Morgoth and his people, Finweg meets Thorndor, who bears him to Mydros. There is no releasing the enchanted bond upon his wrist. In his agony he begs to be slain, but Finweg cuts off his hand, and they are born away, both born away by, Thor by Thorndor and come to Mithrim. 
The feud is healed by the deed of Finweg, except for the oath of the Silmarils. Um, notice the eagles here. Um, this reference to the eagles, and again, this is one of those moments to me where the fact that this is plot summary um, uh, is most apparent. Even the kind of interruption here, because we, we've got... Um, I can't, you know, I don't know for sure. I try not to get inside Tolkien's head and say, this is totally how he was thinking, and I'm sure this is how it worked. I don't want to overindulge in crit fic here, but it's really hard at this moment, right? Doesn't this sound like this? Let me let me offer this, you know, this reading here, and you can, it, I find it really seductively plausible. I can't prove that this is what happened. We're halfway through this story, through the, you know, this summary <clears throat> of Finweg's attempt to rescue Mydros, right? Mydros has been captured, and Finweg is going to go and heal the breach uh, and try to rescue Mydros and bring him home. And we've gotten as far as him searching and not being able to get to Mydros. Now we need an eagle, right? It's time for Thorndor to come in and play his first role in any of the stories in the sketch of the Silmarillion, so f the, the, the sketch of the mythology so far. And then it's like Tolkien says, like, oh, shoot. Ah, uh, I never mentioned the eagles yet, right? So the guy, R.W. Reynolds, who's going to be reading this, if I just say Thorndor the eagle comes in, he's going to be like, who the heck are the eagles, right? So hang on a second. I got to back up a minute and be like, okay, Manway, okay, Manway birds, um, uh, he fashions the race of the eagles and stuff, and Thorndor goes out. And oh yeah, and by the way, they, they live right there, right? Um, they live uh, you know out of the reach of Orc and Balrog, um, you know, right there. So uh, um, anyway, yeah, okay. So back to the story, right? Finweg meets Thorndor, who bears him to my dress, right? Resuming story again. I can't prove that that's the sequence in which this happens, but it sure does sound to me like that's what happened. It creates the slightly comical sense. Um, I mean, when I was reading this through yesterday again, I was um, I was really struck in this moment about how much it sounds like man, we just invented them on the fly, right? That, you know, here's here's Finweg, like, man, how am I going to get up there? And Manway is like, wait, eagles, right? Boom! And he makes eagles and sends Thorndor rocketing over there just in time. I, I, I don't think that that's what actually he's suggesting happened here. Um, but, um, but anyway, we, we, whew, he, um, patches that up, right? Uh, introduces the eagles briefly and brings us right back into the story of, uh, Finweg and Maedros. Having done this, though, having been compelled, if indeed he is compelled by the exigency of narrating this particular story, uh, to uh, uh, explain about the eagles, um, notice uh, notice how he does this. Notice the point of the eagles, right? Manway, to whom birds bring news upon Tim Brenting of all things which his far-sighted eyes do not see upon earth, fashions the race of the eagles and sends them under their king to dwell in the crags of the north and watch Morgoth. Okay, so the eagles are brought in. It's not just um yeah, again, what I am what what I would emphasize here is is it's like Tolkien gives himself a sentence, admittedly a long sentence, but he gives himself one sentence to explain what are the eagles, what is their role what are their nature? What's their relationship with Manway? Right. Um, having given himself one sentence in which to convey this, what he emphasizes is they were their whole purpose is to be Manway's eyes in Middle Earth. Right. They are almost an extent. Manway is far sighted. It's one of his attributes. They are like an extension of his eyes. Um, so. Again, this is not just a question of, there are these creatures called eagles, right? And they're pretty much free agents, but they have this arrangement with Manway where they, you know, they tell him what's going on. They kind of keep him in the loop, right? That's not the way the story goes. They are the instruments of Manway. 
They are the instruments of Manway's vision. The reason I emphasize this in this way, and the reason I wanted to talk about this passage, the eagles, you know, the eagles, of course, are really important, as we know through all of Tolkien's writings. Notice how the eagles are not just connected symbolically with divine intervention, right? They're not just associated with the eucatastrophic ending. They are, when pressed to summarize their nature and role in the story in one sentence, they are the direct instruments of the Valar, right? Um, this is why, when I have before answered the question, uh, why don't the eagles fly the ring to Mordor in the Lord of the Rings? There are a number of ways of different kind of levels on which to answer that question. Um, but as I've said in the past, one way to answer that question is basically to say, um, to say, why don't the eagles just take the ring into Mordor is kind of like saying, kind of like asking another question, which is also in its way a, a sensible question. Why doesn't Manwe just pop up and take the ring himself, right? Why, why don't the Valar just show up and say, we'll take that, right? Let's destroy that for you, right? I mean, Aule could uh, come knocking on the door at the Council of Elrond, and, I mean, what's stopping him, right? Um, and, yeah, Yana, exactly. Uh, one reason is that it would be a really awful story. You're totally right. That is a very good reason, and that's always my primary reason um, why. Um, anyway, Manway's not going to do that, right? Again, but, again, the eagles act, the activities of the eagles are linked in this really direct way. Uh, to Manway's own uh, own actions. They are an extension of him. That, I think, is a really important and interesting context um, that we get here in this sketch. At least at this point in the sketch, that's how the eagles are being envisioned. All right. Let's get to one of the complicated issues. Why is Baron a bloody elf in the sketch of the mythology, even briefly? Right? Why are we going there? Um, let's uh, try to sort this out. This is uh, not from the text, but from Christopher's commentary. In section 9, as written, as first written, Barahir already appears as the father of Baron, replacing Egnor, which was the name of Baron's father, uh, you may remember in the Book of Lost Tales. And they are here Ilkarin elves, not men, though this was changed when the passage was revised. In the first version of the Lay of the Children of Hurin, Baron was still an elf, while in the second version, my father shifted back and forth between man and elf. In the opening cantos of the A text of the Lay of Lathian, in, uh, in being by the autumn of 1925, Egnor and his son were men. Now here in the sketch, early 1926, they are again elves, though Egnor has become Barahir. Perplexingly, in section 10 is first written, while Barahir is a famous chieftain of the Ilkarindi, on the same page of the manuscript and quite clearly written at the same time, Baron alone of mortals came back from Mandos in the latter portion of the story. It may well be that the statements in the sketch that Barahir and Baron were Ilkarins were an inadvertent return to the former idea after the decision that they were men had been made. Later, in the original text of the sketch, section 14, Baron is clearly immortal. Okay. So, this is one place where it's really important to remember that... No, this is the place where it is most important to remember. It's not the only place, but it's the place where it is most important to remember that this text comes before the bulk of... That is, comes before the primary text of the Lay of Lathian. Remember the business with the A text and the B text? And you may remember also uh, the the concept that we discussed, uh, uh, our, uh, our fellow reader and student, uh, Alyssa House Thomas's uh, theory, that the A text of the Lay of Lathian is not even really in its origins the Baron and Luthien story at all, um, or even really an elf story. Um, but anyhow... Um, he, 
here is... Okay, so first of all, going back to the tale of Tenuvio in the Book of Lost Tales, Baron is an elf, if you remember. Um, and he's a gnome, whereas uh, Luthien is not, right? She's the daughter of Thingol, or Tin Willent, but whatever. Um, so there was there was a gap between them, right? There was a, there was like a it was a little bit more um, it was a little bit less uh, sort of interracial and more like Montague and Capulet, right? With uh, in in the in the tale as far as the gap between um, between Baron and Luthien, there was still an issue, right? Still an issue of parental approval, but it wasn't a massive transgression of of boundaries. Um, the kind of this kind of nearly inconceivable thing of the mortal uh, and the elf coming together, um, which it does become in the bulk of the Lay of Lathian, the poem which we read last time. It won't last time, last year. Um, I, to me, the thing which makes I've said before. Um, I'm pretty sure I must have said this uh, when we were talking about the Lay of Lathian. I think that the turning point of the Baron and Luthien story, the story that in wi- the, the moment at which the Baron and Luthien story becomes irrevocably the story of a mortal and an elf woman, uh, when it becomes ceases to be just a story about elves back among all these other stories about elves, and instead becomes the fairy tale of the mortal who, lost in the woods as so many mortals and fairy tales are, sees an elf as so many mortals do, falls in love with her, as is not uncommon, but shocking, horror of, well, horror to her dad anyway, she turns and loves him in return, and places her hand in his. Um, the moment, as I said, where this, where I, where I'm convinced that this becomes not just an element in the Baron and Luthien story, but the heart of the Baron and Luthien story, the essence of the Baron and Luthien story. Um, it's that's not it originally. Again, as we saw in the way in the tale of Tenuvio back in volume two of the of the Book of Lost Tales, that wasn't the heart of the story. He was an elf, right? Again, there was there was friction, right? There was a, there were social obstacles to their coming together, but that but that kind of mortal connection with fairy was not the heart of that story. It becomes the heart of the story, not in the Lay of Lathian, but in the short poem, the Light as Leaf on Linden Tree poem that Tolkien wrote. That Tolkien includes in uh, in the the alliterative Children of Hurin, um, but is not in the meter of the alliterative uh, Children of Hurin. Um, that uh, that poem, that love poem, which is, I think that's my very favorite short poem of Tolkien's. Um, I hate committing myself because there's so many of Tolkien's poems that I really love. Uh, you know, I mean, I also love Errantry and the Oliphant poem, not Sam's Oliphant poem, the original uh, Yombo uh, poem um, uh, uh, from the <clears throat> the Freaks of Physiologus. Um, but anyway, anyway, I, I love so many of his poems. But that poem, uh, "Light as Leaf on Linden Tree," um, might be my very favorite of all of his short poems, and it's an it's it's a gorgeous, gorgeous poem, and. Uh, it clearly, the Lay of Lathian is plainly drawing from it, quoting from it at length, including whole lines from it. Um, that becomes the heart of the Baron and Luthien story after that poem gets written. Um, so, Christopher can say what he likes. I am, um, um, I am not, uh, I'm not convinced that Tolkien ever really waffled on that. Um, I just, I just, I think, I I mean, after that poem, and then we see how that poem transforms the Lay of Lathian, um, and the poem, the story is consistent from that, from that. I mean, basically, I am more willing to doubt the dates of many of these texts 
than to doubt the idea that, you know, th- th- basically, I'm, I'm more willing to doubt the dates than I am to believe that Tolkien, having written Light as Leaf on Linden Tree, uh, was like, eh, nah, maybe I'll make Barrett an elf again, right? He's probably just an Ilkarin. Um, yeah, no, I don't, I, I don't believe it. I just, I don't, I don't, I flat don't believe it. Um, so, again, to me, the fact that Barra here is is being connected, his dad is being connected with elves here, suggests to me this this bit was written before um, he had got he had come to that crucial moment. Because again, even the A text of the Lay of Lathian is not there yet, right? We're not. It's he has not reached that moment. He's not written that poem yet, uh, so the story hasn't really um, hasn't really transformed. Carita is teasing me. Uh, she was taking the poetry class where people were trying to pin me down as to which is my favorite poem, and she was just teasing me about, like, have I finally committed myself? And then about the fact that I still said that it might be my favorite, still refusing wholly to commit myself. All right, I need to let you go soon, even though... uh, Okay, almost. Almost. Not quite. All right, let's keep going a bit. Um, Hurin. Man, how important is Hurin? Uh, I mean, Hurin is not just one of the great of the greatest of the heroes of men, right? You read this sketch, and it's like Hurin is like the alpha human of all of the humans. Right? I mean, there is no human hero who is greater than Hurin. Turin Turinbar himself is like, I mean, not exactly a bit part, but I mean, wow, Hurin is the man in uh, <laughs> in the sketch of the mythology. Um, so let's let's look at this here. The mortal armies. This is from, uh, uh, the, of course, the, the Battle of a Number of Tears. The mortal armies whose leader had been whose leaders had mostly been corrupted or bribed by Morgoth desert or flee away, all except Hurin's kin. From that day, men and elves have been estranged, save the descendants of Hurin. Finweg falls. His blue and silver banner is destroyed. The gnomes attempt to fall back towards the hills and Tower Nafuin, Forest of Night. Hurin holds the rear guard, and all his men are slain, so that not a single man escapes to bring news to Hithlam. By Morgoth's orders, Hurin, whose axe had slain a thousand orcs, is taken alive. A thousand orcs! Okay, he gets seventy in the published Silmarillion. A thousand orcs! For crying out loud. By Hurin alone was was Turgon, Finweg's brother, son of Fingolfin, enabled to cut his way back into the hills with a part of his people. The remainder of the gnomes and Ilkarins would have been all slain or taken, but for the arrival of Maedros, Curafin, and Kelegorm, too late for the main battle. Okay. Um. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Arthur and Karita both agree that uh, clearly Chuck Norris should play Hurin uh, in uh, in 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 the film film. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, you're right, Robert. Maybe it's only just the seventy trolls on top of the thousand orcs. It's possible. It's possible. Um, okay. One thing that I want to take notice of here, there are lots of you know details that we can notice again, as 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 Christopher does a very good job of in his commentary about the you know similarities and differences between this depiction of the uh, of unnumbered the Battle of Unnumbered Tears uh, and later on. Um, what I'm especially interested in is not just the transcendent awesomeness of Hurin. Um, by Hurin alone was Turgon, son of Fingolfin, enabled to cut his way back into the hills. But anyway, um, it's not just the transcendent awesomeness of Hurin. Notice the root of the uh, ill will between elves and humans, right? Um, There are two things that I would suggest, that I would point to, um, that I think are really important about the way that this is couched in this paragraph. One, it's a much more stable thing. In the published Silmarillion, we get like, this is why, you know, the elves and, you know, the elves have never forgotten this, right? And so they don't fully trust humans. But this is, um, this is not just like, and the Noldor remember. Remember this, uh, the mythology, the earlier versions of the mythology are still all kind of focused on how did we get to where we are now, right? Um, 
how does the modern the situation of the modern world emerge right that's one of the things that the mythology is kind of explaining why uh why do elves avoid if elves exist existed and still exist why don't we see them around anymore why don't elves hang out with us anymore well from that day men and elves have been estranged right except for the descendants of Horin right so okay so you've got this this very small subset of humans which are uh, uh, still in tight with the elves but since this moment elves and men there's been this gulf between elves and men right so that's one thing that I think is interesting but the second thing the nature of the crime committed by the humans what's the difference or rather what's the significance do you think of the difference between how elves lost the con- how the humans lost the confidence of the elves in the published Silmarillion in the Battle of Unnumbered Tears and what we see here in this version what's first of all what's what's the difference um, what is what is the crime of the humans in the published Silmarillion in the Battle of Unnumbered Tears what do we get in the in 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 in, in the Silmarillion that we don't get here Let's just remind ourselves first before we talk about its significance. Yes, good. Out of active treachery, actual treachery, James, exactly. Um, they attack the elves. They they stab they literally stab them in the back, right? They, they 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 come up and they attack the elves, the ones who are supposed to be their allies from behind. The reason that uh, uh, Mydros, or Mythros, as he's called later on, um, shows up late to the battle as he's delayed, uh, actively belayed, delayed by, uh, by, by uh, you know, the, the wicked Easterlings, remember, who, um, who have come and won his confidence and then betray him and attack him. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. But here, what's the... Um, What's the what's the problem of the men? They're just weak, right? They just desert or flee. They're not treacherous. They don't stab them in the back. They just you can't rely on them, right? It's much less pointed. Um, uh, it's much less pointed. It's just. But it's also, in a sense, more damning, right? Because it's not. I mean, there's a sense in the Silmarillion, and, and it's it's even clearer, right? We, we you get the, you know, you get you get, uh, you know, you get uh, Bor and Olfast. You get the 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 some the Easterlings who are unreliable. But um, you know, so you've got Uldor the Accursed over here, but you've got Hurin over there, right? So the men of Dor Loman and the Easterlings kind of balance each other out. Um, it still suggests maybe you want to be cautious about trusting men because you never know which one you're going to be getting. But at the same time, we certainly can't come to the end of the Battle of Unnumbered Tears with the conclusion, well, men are just, you can't really rely on men at all. I mean, they're just they are just not made of very stern stuff, right? Um, well, both sides of the, both the good men and the bad men actually were made of pretty stern stuff. Um, you just you can't always trust their motives, right? If you get the bad ones, then uh, um, they might do something really nasty and wicked. Here, it's just most men, you know, most human beings are, are kind of just not really good for much, except for Hurin, right? And his descendants. They are awesome. Um, okay, one last, one last thing, which gives me two slides for the price of one. This is Hurin after the uh, uh, after the Turin story. They slay Meme the dwarf who had taken possession and enchanted all the gold. Hurin casts the gold at Thingol's feet with reproaches. Thingol will not have it and bears with Hurin till goaded too far he bids him be gone. So remember they've taken all the taken this big hoard of gold from uh, Nargothrond from the uh, the 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 hoard of of Glaurung, Glorund still. And uh, which, but remember, Meme has cursed it. He enchants all the gold. We hear there in the first sentence. Anyway, so he's brought all this gold and stuff to Thingol's feet. 
Thingol will not have it, and bears with Hurin, until goaded too far he bids him be gone. Hurin wanders away and seeks Morwen, and many for ages after related that they met, that they met them together in the woods, lamenting their children. The enchanted gold lays its spell on Thingol. He summons the dwarves of Nogrod and Belagast to come and fashion it into beautiful things, and to make a necklace of great wonder, whereon the Silmaril shall hang. The dwarves plot treachery, and Thingol, bitter with the curse of the gold, denies them their reward. After their smithying, they are driven away without payment. The dwarves come back, aided by treachery of some gnomes, who were also bitten by the lust of the gold. They surprise Thingol on a hunt, slay him, and surprise the thousand caves, and plunder them. Okay. Um, what do you notice? Well, Adam, you're right. It's the gold, not the Silmaril, that enchants Thingol. Yes, yes. It's the gold uh, which has been brooded on by the dragon, but more importantly cursed by Meme the dwarf that brings this about. Um, exactly. This, um, yes, Nancy, the dwarves plot treachery before Thingol swindles them, but they don't actually enact it until later. Both sides are clearly at fault here. The dwarves are plotting treachery, Thingol kicks them out, and then they come in aided by treachery, and uh, and murder Thingol, right? So the dwarves are not looking very nice, but Thingol is not looking very nice either, right? Um, he uh, uh, he denies them that he they they do the smith craft, um, and Thingol denies them their pay. Um, so um, does this sound familiar? Here's from The Hobbit, chapter 8. So to the cave they dragged Thorin, not too gently, for they did not love dwarves, as the wood elves, of course, and thought he was an enemy. In ancient days they had had wars with some of the dwarves, whom they accused of stealing their treasure. It is only fair to say that the dwarves gave a different account, and said that they only took what was their due, for the elf king had bargained with them to shape his raw gold and silver, and had afterwards refused to give them their pay. I remember very distinctly going through two different, well, three different stages in my relationship with this passage in The Hobbit. Of course, I've been reading The Hobbit since I was eight, and um, I, of course, didn't know any of the history of this when I was eight. Um, stage one of my relationship with this passage, if you don't count the perfect ignorance in which I lived previously, stage one was when I first read the published Silmarillion and read the story of Thingol and the dwarves and said to myself uh, in my in, a, in my a very smug, self-satisfied teenage kind of way... Um, Ah, now I know the real story, right? Ah, okay, so this this is the story that that passage... I remember this passage in The Hobbit, and I was like, okay, that's what it's referring to. It's really about Thingol and the dwarves, right? And uh, and the Nauglamir and the Silmaril. Okay, right. Now I know the real story. That was phase one. But then phase two was when I began to be a little bit dissatisfied with that explanation, and I'm like, okay, on the one hand, right, I see the connection. But, although I convinced myself originally that clearly the story in the Silmarillion was obviously what this passage was referring to, later on I couldn't help but notice that it doesn't actually fit. If you just think about the published Silmarillion, if you only know, as at that point I only knew the published Silmarillion, this doesn't sound right. For the Elf King had bargained with them to shape his raw gold and silver? Raw gold and silver? What the heck are they talking about? And had afterwards refused to give them their pay? I mean, yeah, he refuses to pay them for... But, like, in the published Silmarillion, he just has the Nauglamir, the necklace of the dwarves, in the Silmaril, and he's like, hey, can you put these together? And they're like, we will remake the Nauglamir, right? Uh, and set the Silmaril within it for you. There's no business about shaping raw gold and silver. And so I kind of began to to question, like, what what is this then really referring to? The final stage is finally reading this book. Uh, this is the sketch of the mythology 
is this is the version, you know, so the version of the mythology that Tolkien had in his head when he wrote the sketch with the mythology is the version of the thing that Tolkien had in his head when he wrote The Hobbit. Chronologically, that seems really pretty clear. And you can see this uh, version of the story from the sketch fits this paragraph from The Hobbit like a glove, right? This is like the key and the lock, okay? Um, it is obviously this version of the story that Tolkien is referring to when he writes this paragraph in The Hobbit. Um, as, of course, is unsurprising, because they're, they're done at a very... It's, it's only just a couple years apart. This is the current version of the story. Um, so th that was one thing that I... Th that's one thing that I found enormously satisfying in reading this play. There are a bunch of things like that. Um, moments in The Hobbit where he seems to be referring to Silmarillion stuff, but if you just read the published Silmarillion, it doesn't actually fit. Both Elrond and Gondolin are kind of like that, too, actually. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit, at least with regard to Elrond um, a little bit later on. But, um, yeah, Carita, I didn't exactly assume that it was referring to something. It was only when I read the published Silmarillion and I recognized it, or thought I did. Um, and again, I was so... Uh, so smug, you know, because I'd re read the Silmarillion and, like, you know, none of my other friends who liked Tolkien had. And so I was, like, like I was so insufferable when I was in high school. Um, and uh, so, you know, so I was all like, oh, <clears throat> yes, well, naturally, that passage is a reference to uh, this earlier work uh, called the Silmarillion, where it tells the story of Thingol and the dwarves. And, uh, but again, it's, it doesn't exactly, it doesn't, it doesn't work, it doesn't fit. This, this is what it fits, and notice as we, as you know, as we we're pointing out to Adam, as you were pointing out, it's not the Silmaril, it's the gold. This is the story of the cursed gold, not the story of the Silmaril. It's not the Silmaril at all that causes any of the troubles. In through here, Thingol still got the Silmaril. The Silmaril still gets included and is passed along to Luthien this way, but the Silmaril isn't the issue. It's the cursed gold of Meme the dwarf. Um, we talked about the curse of meme, the incredibly, almost improbably potent curse of meme the dwarf. Um, in uh, when we talk about uh, the uh, the Book of Lost Tales, um, we can see that it's still around. It's not quite as prominent. Like we don't get quite as many references to the curse of meme the dwarf uh, through for you know after this point in the sketch. Um, as we get uh, in the Book of Lost Tales, but um, but nevertheless, that concept is still there, and the cursing of the gold is still the crucial thing, which ends up um, uh, which ends up bringing about certainly the murder of Thingol and the downfall of uh, of Doriath. All right, well, I've um, reached the point where I've now kept you way over time, and I finished more than half of my slides. I am above the fifty percent mark by the way, in case you're betting uh, in the chat room, I will somewhat shamefacedly confess that my total number of slides for tonight was 19, but I've done 11 now, uh, so I think I can rest on my laurels and, uh, um, and uh, uh, adjourn until next time. We'll finish looking at the sketch and start looking at the Quenta next time. The Quenta, so we're going to be jumping forward a few years when he's going to take this outline, and he's going to begin to flesh it out. He's going to begin to turn this into a real story in the uh, in, of the form which it's going to keep, really, uh, in the Silmarillion moving forward. So, thanks everybody for joining me tonight. Great having you guys with me, and I look forward to continuing our discussion next week. Thanks everybody.